Mabuhay and welcome to ASEAN Today. I'm Macy Mercado of Philippine Sentinel in Manila. Selamat berjumpa lagi. I'm Raisa Chantami of the Indonesia Channel in Jakarta and this is your weekly look at the dynamic Southeast Asia region. Muslim-majority countries in Southeast Asia are showing strong support for Palestine in the latest conflict in the Middle East. In a statement issued on May 16th, the leaders of Indonesia, Malaysia and Brunei attacked Israel's airstrikes on Gaza in what they described as an inhumane and colonial with an apartheid policy towards the Palestinian people. Foreign ministers of the three countries also took part in an emergency meeting of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. The OIC meeting convened by Saudi Arabia called out the military attacks on the Gaza Strip in the worst violence in seven years. More than 230 Palestinians, including 65 children, have been killed in the Israeli bombardment. Rockets fired into Israel by Gaza's governing Hamas have killed more than a dozen people. A ceasefire took effect on May 20. First, we hear from global leaders shortly in the program. Here in the Philippines, friendly but candid talks with China were held over the territorial fight in the South China Sea. The presence of hundreds of Chinese vessels inside the Philippines' 200-mile exclusive economic zones has been the latest source of tensions between the two countries. During a virtual conference on May 21st, both countries cited the importance of dialogue in easing tensions and understanding each country's position and intentions in the area. Also discussed during the dialogue was the June 2019 sinking of a Philippine fishing boat by a Chinese fishing vessel. The latest forum is the sixth since the platform was established in 2016 by President Xi Jinping and Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte. It's been more than three months after Myanmar's military seized power and mass protests, military crackdowns, and diplomatic efforts to restore stability still continue. Protesters rallied in towns and cities across Myanmar on May 11 to denounce military rulers 100 days after the general's overthrow of an elected government. Demonstrators took part in marches, motorcycle convoys, and flash protests to evade security forces. Two Myanmar air bases have come under attack with blast and rocket fire on April 29. More than 800 people have been killed by Myanmar security forces since the wave of protests broke out across the country. Leaders of pro-democracy protests in Thailand plan to revive demonstrations when the country's worst COVID-19 outbreak starts to ease. After a long hiatus due to a spike in cases, protest leaders say they're working to draw fresh support from frustrated residents. The movement reached its peak late last year when hundreds of thousands of demonstrators joined calls for more transparency and accountability from King Mahafatya Rolongkan, the Prime Minister's resignation and a constitution rewrite. At least six protest leaders are currently detained awaiting trial, including three activists facing anti-monarchy charges. Twenty fishermen floating helplessly in their disabled boat for three days off the coast of Western Australia have safely arrived back in Indonesia. The men were rescued by the Australian Maritime Safety Authority and a Japanese vessel 670 nautical miles west of Perth on May 15th. Searchers dropped life jackets to the group before an Australian Defence Force aircraft deployed life rafts to the vessel. The boat sank into the Indian Ocean not long after the rescue. Chinese mobile phone brands have made strong inroads here in Southeast Asia, accounting for more than half of all smartphone sales. In Malaysia, Huawei continues to be a market leader, as ASEAN Today's Karina Tasha reports. More than half of all smartphone sales in markets such as Malaysia, the Philippines, and Indonesia are Chinese. With their prominent storefronts in Malaysia's top malls, brands such as Huawei, Oppo, Vivo, and Xiaomi, and others are becoming household names. Huawei is definitely, you know, up there fighting amongst the uh, high-end range, but the mid-range and entry levels where the Chinese brands usually perform a lot better. Over the past 12 months in Malaysia, Huawei was second only to Apple and ahead of Samsung. And between them, Chinese brands had more than a 50% of Malaysian market share. More and more Chinese phones are, I mean, they're including a lot better tech in their phones. Uh, more so on the camera front these days, that, that seems to be the focus. AI, Huawei is definitely up there. A lot of um, consumers are looking for phones with good cameras and Chinese phones, they, they meet that need. All these upgrade configurations have helped to change negative perceptions of the Made in China tag. I think that China's technology is Huawei 
These brands aren't just competing against the likes of Apple and Samsung. They sometimes fight each other for consumer attention. But analysts such competition and the considered push into the Southeast Asian market benefits consumers who seek more choices, higher and better technology for their money. Karina Tasha for ASEAN Today. More ASEAN Today is coming up shortly. Global leaders call for a lasting peace in the latest Middle East conflict. They're in the hot seat next. You are watching ASEAN Today. I'm Macy Mercado in Manila. And I'm Raisa Chantami in Jakarta. A fragile ceasefire between Israel and Palestine was tested with clashes between Israeli police and Palestinians around the Al-Aqsa Mosque. International leaders want to end the violence there in the hot seat. Let me reiterate that the United Nations remain deeply committed to working with Israelis and Palestinians and with our international and regional partners, including the Middle East Quartet, to realize a lasting and just peace. We are in contact with many relevant interlocutors and I again call on the parties to allow mediation efforts to intensify and succeed. The only way forward is to return to negotiations with the goal of a two-state solution, leaving two states side by side in peace, security and mutual recognition with Jerusalem as the capital of both states, all based on relevant UN resolutions, international law and prior agreements. The longer this cycle of violence continues, the more challenging it will be to reach that ultimate goal. Only a negotiated, sustainable political solution will end once and for all these devastating cycles of violence and lead to a peaceful future for Palestinians and Israelis alike. All of us know that this conflict is asymmetric by nature between Israel, the oppressor, the occupying power, and the Palestinian, the occupied, who are continuously being oppressed. Occupation is the core issue. The international community owes the Palestinian people a long overdue independent state of Palestine, living side by side in equal footing with all of us. This continued occupation and aggression by Israel does not only warrant condemnation, but it is also a grave violation of international law that demands our actions. Thus, I call the UN General Assembly to take three actions. First, stop the violence and military action to prevent further casualties. At the same time, the General Assembly should demand for an, an immediate, durable, and fully respected ceasefire. All avenues must be exhausted to de-escalate the situation urgently. Furthermore, we must be able to prevent future recurrence of the atrocities. Serangan Israel ke atas Palestine merupakan tindakan yang mencaboli undang-undang antarabangsa, undang-undang hak asasi manusia, undang-undang kemanusiaan antarabangsa, piagam, pertubuhan bangsa-bangsa bersatu PBB, serta merupakan jenayah perang yang menyalahi Konvensyen keempat Geneva 1949. Saya percaya rakyat Malaysia yang cintakan keamanan berpegang teguh kepada pendirian bahawa tiada alasan kukuh bagi penggunaan kekerasan yang dilakukan secara tidak seimbang, sembarangan dan melampau ke atas Palestin dan menolak sekeras-kerasnya tindakan keji rejim Israel ke atas rakyat Palestin. I think everybody is very concerned and certainly we in the UK are very sad to see what is uh, is happening and uh, the cycle of, uh, of violence that now seems to be uh, taking place. And I think it's important that we break that cycle and we end the, uh, this idea of, of reprisals. And uh, I think that what everybody wants to see is urgent, urgent uh, de-escalation. The cycles of violence will only stop 
with a political resolution to the conflict, including addressing the status of Jerusalem and other final status issues with an end to the occupation and the realization of a two-state solution on the basis of the 1967 lines, UN resolutions, international law, and mutual agreements with Israel as capital of both Israel and Palestine. I reiterate my call to the members of the Middle East Quartet, key Arabs and international partners, as well as to Israel and Palestinian leadership to strengthen efforts to return to meaningful negotiations towards a viable two-state solution. Israel says it's carrying out airstrikes on Gaza to defend itself, but the UN says the right to self-defense belongs to people living under occupation. More I'll see on today is coming up shortly. Here in the Philippines, people need help, so helping hands are reaching out to the needy in this ongoing pandemic. This is ASEAN Today, and we are coming to you this week from Jakarta and Manila. The double economic burden of job losses and rising prices of commodities have hit the Philippines hard. People here have yet to recover from one of the world's longest and strictest COVID-19 lockdowns. But as ASEAN Today's Aisha Nadir reports, helping hands are reaching out. Hundreds of community pantries have popped out throughout the Philippines to give out fresh produce and other food products to those affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. In the midst of scorching heat, dozens of people line up at this food store in Quezon City. They are waiting for their turn to receive donated food. Some even say that they just wanted to help as much as they can, with many of the kind-hearted donators even unwilling to say their names. We brought vegetables. Um, actually, this is the second um, area that we went, we will be going to another area to drop off another set of vegetables and then tomorrow we'll do another round. This is the first time to do it. Initially I wanted to do one but uh, I have kids so instead of doing that I'll be donating. The donated food offerings have proved an enormous help to residents who are struggling amid these uncertain times. Amy Padlan, a mother of four, said her family is short of food as her husband only makes a small income by running a stall. I feel very blessed because we are the one uh, nearby in this area, in this community. This one, food. And everything that is essential, that is, even though not not only the, the, the shelter because we, are, we have a small room, but the food. At least 80 community pantries have been set up in various places in Metro Manila, with more than 300 others across the country. All in the spirit of people helping people. Aisha Nadira for ASEAN Today. Here are several events on the ASEAN calendar. The Pagdayao Festival will take place from June 11th to the 12th in Masbate, Philippines. Pounding drum beats and delicious dumplings will highlight the Dragonwood Festival on June 14th in Singapore. And runners will line up for the Monkey Trail event from June 25th to the 27th in Koh Samui, Thailand. Since the COVID-19 outbreak, normal life has come to a standstill. Major festivals across the world have been cancelled and concert tours have been postponed. As ASEAN Today's Fauzul Azim reports, performers in Singapore are coming up with new ways to step into the spotlight. The Singapore government has in place a number of prevention to curb the spread of COVID-19. As a result, international performing groups are faced problems entering and exiting the country. The Singapore Conference Hall is a music oasis in the country, providing a venue for artists to showcase their talents. Before the coronavirus, there was one performance every two or three days here. That dropped only two performances per month after the outbreak. And uh, we used to stage about 100 to 120 concerts, but now we have to reduce or cancel some of the concerts or postpone some of the concerts when we have um, guest artists from overseas to conduct or to play solo with us. Due to pandemic prevention measures, the total numbers of performance, technical supporting and logistic personnel of each performance are conditioned imposed on large-scale performances. 
to avoid mass gatherings and to maintain safe social distances, Singapore also prohibits performance outdoor in institutions as well as in schools. To ease the economic impact on the performance industry, Singapore has given nearly 40 million US dollars of subsidies to relevant industries. The government is calling for corporate assistance, hoping to help the sector survive the crisis. To help itself, entertainers have begun to seek transformation, changing and reshaping its digital marketing capabilities and expanding the numbers of audience willing to pay for performances on digital platforms. Classical, education outreach, pop. And now we have to add additional pillar of digital. So we cannot do away with the digital in the new normalcy in terms of the presentations of arts, culture, performances. Musicians have adapted to the pandemic by live streaming from their homes, producing organic performances with nothing but their voice and instruments and loving fans a peek into their personal spaces. It's uncertain climate for the arts industry, which relies on physical events to earn revenue. Of the 200,000 self-employed workers who make up Singapore's gig economy, 47% are arts practitioners. From musicians to artists managers to crew members, all hope the curtain will rise again before too long. Fauzul Azim for ASEAN Today. We like hearing from you throughout the ASEAN region and the world. All of our episodes are posted on YouTube, so check us out there if you can't find us on your local TV channel. Then, let us know what you're thinking or what you want to see on the program. Email us at ASEANtodayTV at gmail.com. Post something on our Facebook page or tweet us at ASEANtodayTV. It's usually a controversy-free event, a young woman representing their countries in an international beauty competition. That's right, Raisa. But in this year's Miss Universe pageant, several contestants made political and social statements on the runway. During the national costume segment of the competition on May 16, Miss Universe Singapore, Bernadette Bell Ong strode down the runway wearing an outfit inspired by the colors of Singapore's national flag before turning to unveil a call to stop Asian hate. Miss Myanmar to Zarwin Lin held up her simple statement, Pray for Myanmar. The winner was Miss Mexico, Andrea Meza. She beat 73 other women representing their countries and territories. And that's ASEAN Today. I'm Macy Mercado of Philippine Sentinel in Manila. And I'm Rai Sachantami of the Indonesia Channel in Jakarta. Thank you for watching. Please join us again next time for ASEAN Today.